you go ahead and be seated, and as you're seated online as well, this is a great day. This is our Kingdom Builders Day, so we've had a couple of weeks now. This is our second Sunday of Kingdom Builders, and Kingdom Builders is our missions emphasis here at Portico, and we are delighted to have Noel and Marnie Hutchinson with us today. Would you give a hand to them as they join us? Good morning. And so you're representing for us Asian Outreach, yes. and in fact, we were just chatting before the service that if you recall, just pre-COVID, 2019 right, in the fall, That's right. we had one of our teams join you. Where were they at? They were in Cambodia, and uh, I've got to say, Portico, it was probably one of the very, very best teams we have ever had in Asia in 30 years. So Dwayne does behave himself. He does. He does with some guidelines. With some guidelines. All right. You got to kind of hedge him in a little bit. All right. Well, we've, if you haven't seen Dwayne, he's out by the KB Cafe today, and you can drop by. And if you're online, be sure to come back in person one day and just check out the KB Cafe. It is so good to have it's you here. We're here, looking Doug. forward to hearing about what's going on, what God is doing, Thank you. and how you're navigating these challenging days. Thank you. It's God good to be you. here. Good morning, Portico Church family. I, I think worship almost destroyed me <laughs> because there were some songs sung that just fit in so much with the whole theme of what I felt God was wanting me to share this morning. So Marnie and I are really, really excited to be with you. It's, it's a great Sunday and God is good. So I would like to say thank you to Pastor Doug and the leadership team, Rick, and your mission team. And I want to say a, a, a massive thank you to you, Portico Church family, because you are a huge part of why we are able to continue doing what we're doing over many years now. And we're, we're, we're grateful. You are a significant part of it. Um, it's, it's a fact that most of you will never probably be able to see where we are working firsthand. But we want you to know that your investment is touching lives in at-risk communities uh, and unreached areas across places like Mongolia, Thailand, Cambodia, uh, two unrestricted uh, restricted access nations in Southeast Asia. So you are having a direct impact in places that you may never see, maybe some of you have. So if I can summarize what God has called us to do this morning, uh, we have a passion to share the gospel where the gospel has never been uh, spoken before. It's not reached. We, we want to focus on women and children at risk because they are almost always the most vulnerable in the communities that we work in. We want to stand alongside the local church, and if there is no local church, we want to be the local church in those unreached areas to bring hope and healing. So, this morning, uh, I would like to take you on a twofold journey. One is kind of where we work, and the other is kind of my own journey as we, as we have tried to understand what God is still calling us to do. So, we've had the opportunity to work in, in this amazing part of the world for just over 32 years now. And, and there's, there's no one country in this part of the world that is like the other. Each is different, each is unique, uh, each has had its often rich and sometimes very, very complicated journey. And many of you would know this from your own histories as well. We began our journey in, in Asia in 1990, living in Thailand for a number of years, and we had the opportunity to start a, a student center reaching out to a community of 35 to 40,000 university and technical school students that, that had no full-time outreach uh, by anyone into those campuses. And we planted a, a center uh, 30, almost 30 years ago, and thanks be to God, it is still in action operating in northern Thailand today. I, I would love to have the time to tell you some of the miracles, like absolute miracles of how that center was started, but that might have to wait for another day. And from 1997 on, uh, God expanded our, our focus to include countries like Cambodia and, uh, and restricted access nations and the unbelievable country of, of Mongolia. So we are grateful for God's call in our lives. But I, I would like to narrow in on the country of Cambodia for uh, just a couple of minutes. 
Cambodia is called the Kingdom of Wonder, and we've been working in this country for over two, uh, 20 years, and Cambodia stole our hearts, and, and really, truly, it is a, a kingdom of, of wonder. Um, where else can you go to see a modified motorcycle towing a load that we would absolutely require a pickup truck to do in our country? It's, it's pretty unbelievable. And we were driving from Stung Treng in northern Cambodia down to Phnom Penh in these uh, dusty roads, and, and I looked out the back window and, and saw this full-on rollover vehicle going down the road, and there was this Cambodian guy in there with a crash helmet on, driving this car, and the wheels were all out of a line, and it was just absolutely unbelievable. So I, I wonder how he was able to do that. And, and then you've got interesting foods, and maybe some of you enjoy them, and I don't dislike some of it, but uh, you've got uh, snakes and things like that, and uh, yes, we've eaten them, though I wonder why, and they do taste like chicken. <laughs> we had a team from Peterborough uh, with us a few years back, and uh, we were traveling out of Phnom Penh to one of our project areas. And we stopped by this little roadside cafe, you know, because iced coffee originated in this part of the world. So the best iced coffee is still from that part of the world. So everybody was inside and getting coffee. And I was standing by the opening just watching the, the local traffic going by. And this little lady, she has this burlap sack and she comes walking up. And there was another little lady behind her and she's got this tray like this of of deep-fried tarantulas, all nicely piled and seasoned. And, and this other lady in this burlap sack, she unties it, opens it up, and these live tarantulas start crawling up her arms and at her hair, and she's picking them off and putting them back in the bag. And one of the men from the uh, Peterborough team came running out and said, Noel, could you please, please just ask them to leave the women were just beside themselves. And if you knew my daughter, she'd have been right there asking me to tell them to leave. Um, I, I have eaten them, but I wonder why. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not all that good. Those weren't tasting like chicken at all. <laughs> Cambodia is a, a country uh, where Portico had an opportunity to, to send a team and see what we're doing firsthand there. And I'm, I'm grateful for your investment. Pastor Duane was a little hard to control, but apart from that, we had an amazing time. <laughs> Actually, Pastor Duane is awesome, would you agree? Um, I want to just talk about the years 1976 to 1979 when this country was absolutely decimated. The Khmer Rouge tore apart the, the, the fabric of their society. Um, doctors and lawyers and teachers, uh, anybody who spoke a foreign language, if you wore glasses, if you were highly educated, uh, men and women and children, brutally murdered with the goal, one singular goal, of building this socialist, this agrarian or agricultural utopia, a grand vision. And the last of the heavy equipment and the artillery was not decommissioned until between 1999 and the year 2000. It's not that long ago, really. I, I remember my first trip to Cambo uh, Cambodia, and I w we were used to poverty. We lived in northern Thailand. We, we, we looked after a little hill tribe church. We were in and out of ethnic minorities and hill tribes, and we'd seen poverty firsthand, but, but there was something about Cambodia. It was, I, I landed, and we got off the plane, and we drove in from this little shoebox airport into the, into the city, and, and the road you could lose a vehicle in, it was so rough. There was this darkness and this heaviness. It was almost smothering. And uh, one of our staff members picked me up and took me to this uh, lady's house, and uh, she prepared this absolutely brilliant, 
yellow chicken curry with rice, and I still remember it so, so well, and sat there, and she told us her story because she had lost her husband, her kids, her parents, all her siblings to the brutal atrocities of the Khmer Rouge. She was alone in the world. And it was quite a meal. And I, and I looked at the cement wall behind me, and there was this gouge out of the wall. And, and our staff member said, yeah, that was, a, that was a bullet that struck here a couple of nights ago. And uh, I couldn't wait to leave the country. When I got on the plane, I said, I am never coming back here again. It was overwhelming. S21 is a high school, a place of education where kids were supposed to go and receive hope and education and opportunities for the future, and the Khmer Rouge turned it into a place of execution. Walked around and looked at the faces of the victims, tried to, un tried to fathom what happened in that place, and it was overwhelming. You know, and as we witness what's happening in Ukraine right now, Friends, it's a clear reminder that we are living in a broken world. Our enemy is raging, and we are in desperate need of our Savior to come and make it better. Over 40 years later, the fallout is still a reality for communities across this country. Human trafficking and girls and boys are still exported, and women and children are still cheap labor. There's extreme poverty everywhere, endless cycles of poverty, but, most, but mostly it's this loss of dignity. And the facts tell us that 50% of the population are under 25. 75% of the population is under 35 years of age. It's a young, young country because so many of the, the, the previous generation were taken out of the scene. Many live on less than a dollar a day. But God gave us a vision. We'd been in the central parts of Cambodia for over 20 years. We'd been there since the United Nations was uh, uh, a peacekeeping force. And God called us to leave the central part of Cambodia and go to the six unreached provinces to the very, very north of Cambodia that border Thailand and Laos and bring the good news. And we went up there, we packed a van full of our staff, and we went out there, and we drove around, and we walked through the marketplaces, and we prayed, and we asked God, what do you want us to do here? We sense you're calling us here. So we, we, we met with some of the government officials, Ministry of Education and Rural Affairs, and, 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 and we said, what can we do? They knew a little bit about who we are from, from the work we've done in the central parts. And they talked about this community and that community, and they need help, and, and this community is really desperate. And, and as we talked with them and, uh, and got up to leave, this one official, he said, but wait, wait. He said, um, whatever you end up doing, don't forget our children. They have no hope. Very few have access to education and no future. Don't forget our children. Portico, you are helping us reach the children in northern Cambodia. We bought land. And we didn't think what might be hidden in the ground. We hired an international construction company to, to help us with our planning for developing the land, and they said, do you have a mine clearance form? And, you know, we looked at each other and go, this is just outside of Stung Trang, this town. Why would we need a mine clearance form? And they said, we don't touch anything in Cambodia without a mine clearance form. So 3,500 US dollars later, we had the mine clearance guys come in with all their equipment and sweep 11 hectares of land. And uh, they uncovered bombs, unexploded ordinances all over that property. And we'd been digging fence holes and putting in foundations for workshops, and uh, God was certainly with us. But we prayed, and we planned, and we dreamed, and God provided us with the Hope Center, 700 square meter training facility, 60 kilometers south of a restricted access nation. God is good, and your team has seen it firsthand, been involved in it firsthand, 
and I am so grateful. You know, it's a place where people can meet and be trained, hear the good news, have hope for the future. It's got a large commercial kitchen where kids who are wanting to get into the emerging hotel and hospitality industry can, can come and be trained. It's got a boardroom for, for meetings and board meetings and having businesses come in and hold their meetings and do training and things like that. Classrooms with laptops. We've got a, a bank of 20 laptops and most of these kids are turning on computers for the very first time. And on one wall, you can kind of see it in the, in, in the slide up in the corner, we've got a great big world map. And so many of these kids couldn't even find Cambodia on a world map. This is about bringing hope and education. It's a place where farmers are taught intensive agricultural uh, techniques. This, this family, it's, it's quite a story. When we first met them, their two children were not going to school because they couldn't afford the uniforms or the stationery. And, and, but, but, but they said, but we're willing to be trained, we're willing to learn. They were only planting one crop. And through learning intensive agricultural techniques, they went from earning $350 to over $4,000 US dollars per year their kids are going to school fully dressed in uniforms. They've bought hand tractors to increase their production and neighbors are looking and seeing going, we want to be trained too. You know, this is a place where we can meet and train local church leaders from all across the north in Cambodia. And, and not very, very long ago, it was in 2019, we were doing some training and I was sitting at the back uh, back of the room beside this, this gentleman. And as the training's going on, I, had, I was sitting down and I had my hand on my, on my thigh. And I, I saw him kind of looking over. And, and he, he, he reached over and he put his slim, slim, dark, weathered hand on top of mine. And he looked at me and smiled. I knew what he was doing. It was one of those moments, one of those moments and I looked at him and I said, two colors. I said, it's good. And he smiled. He knew what I was saying. Different, but good. That's how God made us. Made in his image. Well, grabbed one of my staff members after and, uh, and said to him, uh, said, tell Noel, we walked three days out of the jungle for this. Next time, make it longer. We have a mandate to bring clean water and sanitation to villages, working off the, 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 the idea that there, what is the greatest needs that God could help us solve in communities. And last year, we uh, put 400 biosan water filters in 400 homes, drilled 70 wells in communities that had no wells, almost 200 kids are supported to go to school with the resources and uniforms and flip-flops and stationery and all those things that they need. We're working with the, the, the families and the local leaders to bring income and food security because many of the parents and families can't afford even the basics like a uniform that is required for them to go to school. So often they're forced to work in the fields. So when they come back to school, they may be 13 or 14 years of age in grade three when they finally get the, the opportunity for learning. But the vision doesn't stop there. Like I said, we are 60 kilometers south of a restricted access nation. People in this country deserve to hear the good news. The very south of this country is largely unreached. So we invited some of the evangelists and church planters from this country to come join us for one week to sit around the table and not for us to tell them what to do, but we wanted to hear their heart to reach their country and find out how does God want us to stand alongside of you because the southern part of this country needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We sat and we prayed and we made notes. We drew on whiteboards and then we toured around the southern part of this place and then came back together. 
We're currently trying to see how the Hope Center and our, and our understanding of water and sanitation and, and crop rotations can be a blessing to the communities in the South. How we can help eradicate extreme poverty. And when I was sharing this, the gentleman on the right, he's a church planner and an evangelist, and these are passionate, passionate guys willing to go places under circumstances that are really hard to believe. And he stood and he just, he wept. And he said, this is what's missing. This is what's missing. This is what God wants to put together. You see, it's about serving the unreached, the outcast, the widow, the orphan, the marginalized, the, hope, the hopeless. That's our privilege as followers of Christ. So I want to share for just a couple of minutes my, my own journey because it fits into this. Uh, I've been wrestling with a, to try and understand, you know, what is, that, is God actually calling the church? What is God actually calling us to do? To understand his mission for his world, how we're to be involved, and what this looks like practically on the ground where God calls us. And friends, God has called each one of us as individuals into his mission of transformation. So I've got some really good news to share. John 3.16. Can we say it together? Let's, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So I was in Mongolia and we were doing some training with some Mongolian leaders and the worship was vibrant and we were having an awesome time and it was my, my turn to, to share for a little while. And uh, so I asked them, John 3.16, who knows John 3.16? And hands go up all over the place. And I said, okay, say it. And in Mongolian, they started saying John 3.16. And I said, okay, John 3.17, go. And there was dead silence. We know John 3.16 well, but you can't separate it from John 3.17. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Friends, that's exciting. That's exciting. This good news is, 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 is about salvation and healing. It is not about condemnation. It gives me hope for the future, for our world. You know, you were singing this morning, and that was so amazing. The whole reason we meet together, the whole reason you're sitting here this morning in Portico, everything we do hinges on one event. It's the resurrection. Now, here's something to think about. Jesus was preaching the good news of the kingdom before the crucifixion and before the resurrection. He was on the ground in our world challenging another kingdom. Here's what Paul has to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is one of my all-time favorite passages. Paul reminds the Corinthians of the good news. So what is the good news? Well, it hinges on what Paul writes, that he, Christ, died, was buried, and he was raised to life on the third day. And we just passed Easter, and we just sang about it this morning. And, 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 I, and I, I love how one preacher said it. He said, you killed him. God raised him from the dead. Now say you're sorry. And some don't. Because some didn't believe the resurrection. And Paul is saying, if there is no resurrection, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. And you are still in your sins. Your faith is futile. It means nothing. He said, we are to be pitied then more than all men. He said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. So I want to really reemphasize this as this key and foundation, foundational to everything we preach and our mission to a lost world. I was really wrestling through that. There is no hope if hope is only for this life. Think about it. 
we do not persevere in our belief if it's only one system to help us through this life among all the other belief systems in the world. We don't, we don't do that. We don't persevere believing this if it's just to make us better in this life. If this were true, then friends, pick what suits you, live your life, and don't look back. If the resurrection is not true, there is no mission. The church has no mission. But Christ died and rose again on the third day and conquered our last enemy, death. And that is why we hope and celebrate this morning. The resurrection sealed his authority to build his kingdom. John the Baptist came preaching that the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus said similar words, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. So then what is the gospel? What's this good news of the kingdom that Jesus came to preach? So the disciples asked the Son of God, Lord, teach us to pray. Could, could we read this together? It's the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, not sometime in the future. May his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, Matthew 6.33. And in this chapter, Jesus is talking with people who are worried about the things they need in life. And friends, I worry. I think if you're honest, you'll tell me that there are days when you worry too. They need things in life. We all need things in life. But Jesus said these words. He said, seek first my kingdom above everything else. More than anything else, seek first his kingdom. And there's this word, kingdom. So what does it mean? Kingdom means dominion, authority, and rule. And righteousness means all that is good and right and true. All that God wants us to know. So let's insert that into Matthew 6.33. So seek first his dominion authority, and rule, all that is good and right and true. That's what his kingdom is all about, one that is good and right and true. It's about his dominion and rule and authority coming into our homes, our families, our communities to see justice, mercy, and salvation reach a lost and hopeless world. Jesus was serious when he told his disciples to pray this prayer. He is the Son of God, and that's the prayer he asked his disciples to pray. So I started thinking about this and asked myself, would our approach to transforming our world change if we asked a different question? Take a community, any community, Maybe a place or a neighborhood where God has been tugging at your heart, Mississauga, and ask this question, what would it look like if the kingdom of God actually showed up here? What would change? What doesn't look like that kingdom? If the enemy comes only to steal and kill and destroy, does it not make sense that God's kingdom is the exact opposite of that? to bring healing and hope and transformation. So I asked our staff in Cambodia, what in the communities and villages that you work in doesn't look good and right and true? We were on dirt bikes and we'd been around this amazing loop in very, very rural Cambodia, surveying the area. 
and uh, we had come out of the jungle, and uh, we stopped in this village, and we had the opportunity to go in and sit down with the, some of the village leaders, and their houses are on stilts, and the animals are running around, and, and the, we just started introducing ourselves and asking questions and looking around, and, uh, and, and I said, where, where are your children? Where are your teenagers? He said, oh, some of them have gone to Phnom Penh, and some of them have gone to Thailand, and some of them have gone to Malaysia, and they're working in restaurants and coffee shops and places like that. I said, do any of them ever come home? And he said, not many. I said, uh, what do you do for money? He looked at me and said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, what do you do for money? And he says, well, we don't have any. He, I said, so, so then how do you buy what you need? And he said, well, we, we trade and we, we borrow and take the things that we have and trade. And had one, one crop season, one rotation of rice, and that's it. And the rest of the year, they have nothing. And God help them if there's a drought or a flood. And I walked out of that house and I walked down the trail and I sat down on a log and I bawled. And, and I said, God, what kind of hope could we ever, ever bring to this village? And God spoke to me almost audibly. And today, friends, we are assisting children to school in that village. And, and that couple you saw that went from $350 to $4,000 came from that village a road went through, we've been working there, kids are going to school, people are being elevated out of extreme poverty, and there is a church happening in that village right now. So, if God is love, if Christ came to give us abundant life, would his kingdom bring clean water to a village? give them access to health care, give children a chance to go to school, protect boys and girls from human traffickers, give parents the dignity of work and an income? Would it help train people? Would it stop domestic violence? Would it help restore dignity and hope to people who are made in God's image, friends, because Scripture tells us that we are made in his image. We have value, we have dignity because we are his. I wanna close with a story. When Asian Outreach first started working in Cambodia, the United Nations was still there as a peacekeeping force. It was a diminished Buddhist country. They had destroyed everything, including some of the temples. Approximately two million people in Cambodia lost their lives in the genocide, and that is not including all that have lost their lives due to the ripple effect. And we started going into communities outside the greater Phnom Penh area, doing water and sanitation and building health clinics and dental clinics, running the country's first river ambulance, building the country's first maternity clinic outside the capital. And we dug deep and we stayed there. According to government statistics, when we got there, there were no known Christians. And today, according to government statistics, there are between 15 and 18 percent followers of Christ in those provinces. One of the programs we had is assisting children to school. And uh, um, on one occasion when we were there, giving out all the backpacks, and it's a big ceremony, and there's lots of stuff going on. Given the back, the kids come up, they've got to be fingerprinted just to satisfy all the government regulations. Given the backpacks, and a number of kids who have to travel much further were given bicycles. And like all the ceremonies in that part of the world, every official's got to come up and have his minute in the spotlight, and it was... Uh, it was interesting because one official, he got up and he said these words, I want to thank the God of Asian outreach. 
He must love us very much. Portico, thank you for joining us on this unbelievably awesome journey of bringing hope and transformation and healing to villages and communities and unreached areas across Asia, especially in Cambodia, where you have made a big investment. We are so grateful. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father God, we are grateful that you have brought us into your kingdom, that you have given us a part to play, that you are bringing hope to places that have no hope, bringing a message of salvation, bringing hope and healing. I thank you for Portico Community Church. I pray your blessing would rest upon this place, that you would inspire the leadership, Father God. Give them vision and passion for their community. Give them vision and passion for their world, that we would be an inspired group that would go out and bring change and hope and healing. You have blessed us so much, Father. We have much to give, including your message of salvation, to love you, to love our neighbor as ourself. So we are grateful for this time together. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.